This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybill from the Hidden Killers Podcast. Hidden Killers Podcast. That it is. Now let's go to segment number four on day two of the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed state, uh, states exhibits 11A through 11G. Detective, do you recognize those exhibits? <clears throat> I do. What do they purport to be? They are the photographs of the pet cemetery and the burial site that we later located, uh, Tylee Ryan. Okay, is this the same area you testified, or is this the same pet cemetery area you testified to earlier today? Yes. And uh, this is something you saw with your own eyes? Yes. Uh, and you saw this on June 9th and June 10th, 2020? Yes, that's correct. Um, Your Honor, I'd ask that states exhibits... Uh, uh, one moment, Your Honor. I'd ask the state's exhibits 11A through 11G be entered into evidence. All right. Any objection to any of those exhibits from the defense? If I could have just a second, Judge. You may. No objection. Okay. Uh, just to keep the record clear, exhibits <coughs> states 11A. 11B, 11C, 11D, 11E, 11F, and 11G have all been admitted and may be published. Detective, can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11A? This is the pet cemetery. Uh, as I earlier testified, we knew it was the pet cemetery because of the black dog statue that was next to the post. Detective, uh, can you, with the pointer, point out the black dog? Sorry. Right there. Thank you. <clears throat> also in this photograph is the fire pit that is sectioned off that we were also going through, and the blue tarps, anything of interest or evidentiary value that we uh, dug out of the ground were placed on the blue tarps. Thank you. Detective, can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11B? As I testified earlier, when we began digging down, we could notice the difference in soil uh, from dry soil to a moist soil, and we started to, to get into... Uh, clumps of, of rotted flesh, charred flesh, um, and, and this is starting to get down into the rotted flesh and the charred flesh. There's a piece of broken charred bone sticking up through the dirt, um, and that's, that's what that photograph is. Detective, can you describe what you observed in State's Exhibit 11C? Sorry, 
Maybe that's the best way. As we began digging down and, and this, the flesh and bone began coming out of the ground, we would, we had our, our rubber gloves on, grab it out of the ground and place it on the blue tarp that I described earlier. Um, this is just a portion of some of the flesh and, and charred bone, broken bone that we had uncovered at that time. It still has some dirt on the on the charred flesh, but there's bone fragments. There's some more bone fragments, some bone there, and the rotted charred flesh that was attached to that bone. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11D? <clears throat> what I testified earlier about the mass, the 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 clump of of flesh and bone that was placed into the melted green bucket. Um, that's what you're looking at here. You, you can see the the part of the plastic green bucket. Um, there's parts of bone sticking out here. Um, this area here is all uh, burnt flesh, um, fatty tissue. There's organs that weren't completely burnt through all the way. Um, like it was just placed in the bucket and kind of stayed there. So we dug around that bucket the best we could. Uh, we would get in there and, and dig by hand um, with, with paint brushes or anything that we can get. Uh, underneath this bucket, you can start seeing the partial remains of a human skull underneath the, the melted bucket. Detective, how long did this process take you? Hours. Um, like I said, we could only we were only able to get down there on our hands and knees for a couple minutes before we had to uh, have somebody else come relieve us because of the smell. Detective, what did you observe in States Exhibit 11E? This is a close-up of the partial skull that was under the melted green bucket bucket it was a plat bucket um, and you can see the white lettering there's an L there uh, but the bucket itself was was melted and all that was stuffed inside and uh, underneath there was part of uh, the top of the skull and we also found a jawbone uh, underneath this portion here that isn't depicted in that picture. Detective Wood, did you observe in States Exhibit 11F? After we removed that mass of flesh, um, after it broke into clumps and we tried to pick it up and it, it, it broke up and we had to, by hand, pick everything up and put it onto the tarp, um, that's what was left. It was the moist soil. Um, and so we dug down a little bit more, found some, some teeth but that is after we took the, the teeth and the flesh, everything out of the hole. That's what was left was the moist soil. We dug down further to make sure that we had um, found everything and there was nothing else after that. And Detective, what do you observe in State's Exhibit 11G? This was part of the 
of tile that was inside of the bucket that had broken up when we tried to move it onto the mat or onto the tarp. Um, there's bone, charred bone, charred flesh, um, rotting flesh. There's there's part of the top of a skull here. The orbital sockets are there. Um, that's the top of the skull. Um, these are just some of the parts that that we had to get out of the ground and placed onto the tarp. Detective, I believe you testified earlier that on June 10th, you and Detective Ball followed the Fremont County coroner and took these remains to Ada County. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And what did you do with them on <clears throat> June 10th? June 10th, we dropped them off and and left uh, J.J. and Ty Lee with the 80 County Coroner in their custody. Um, and we agreed to come back the next morning on June 11th to perform the autopsy. Okay. And did you do that? Did you go back on June 11th? We did. Okay. Uh, what was the first thing you did when you got there on June 11th? Initially, we met with the medical examiner, Dr. Garth Warren. Uh, we met in his office. He briefed us with what we were about to go through, um, kind of walked us through what was going to happen. And at that time, uh, he walked us down a hall. We put on uh, booties on our, on our shoes. Uh, we had gloves. Um, we signed in on the whiteboard, everybody that was inside the room. Um, and at that time, uh, Dr. Warren and his team brought out uh, the black body bag that had contained uh, the black plastic bag that we had taken out of the ground that day before. What did you observe next? They cut the seal on the body bag and unzipped the body bag, and it revealed the black plastic bag that had the duct tape. Um, he placed that bag onto the metal table. Um, it still had dirt on it from when we had taken it out of the ground. Um, they took photographs, did whatever they need to do, and... Uh, they cut down the center of the black plastic bag. Huh. When they cut down that plastic bag, what did you observe? I saw <clears throat> um, a little boy in red pajamas. Um, he had a white plastic bag around his head several layers of duct tape from his chin to his forehead area. Uh, his arms were duct tape with several layers of duct tape. His arms were folded like this across his chest. You guys see that? Um, his feet were also duct taped and bound. He had a white and blue child's blanket um, placed on top of him. Okay. What did you observe happen next? Uh, Dr. Warren cut open the bag that was wrapped over JJ's head. <clears throat> um exposing what was underneath um, and underneath that 
white plastic bag, there was another layer of duct tape across his mouth from jawline to jawline. Okay. And then what happened? Uh, he then cut the duct tape away from his arms um, to expose his wrists and, and his forearms. And when he did that, there was also another level, level of duct tape wrapped around his wrists. So his wrists were bound this way. Um, yeah. yeah. Did you remain for uh, the entirety of, of J.G. Vallow's autopsy? I did. Um. Once that duct tape was removed, uh, what did you observe? Through the videos and pictures that we had seen of J.J. for the last eight months, the nonstop looking, the, the tips coming in, the uh, everything we had obtained and looked at, um, I was able to recognize that little, same little boy lying on the table to be J.J. Vallow. Uh, he had the same haircut. It was short on the sides, long brown hair on the top. Um, so he was, I recognized him as J.J. Okay. Was there anything else that was, uh, that stood out to you during that autopsy? Um... His, his pajamas were soaked with body decomposition. Um, he had still had on his pull-up nighttime diaper. Um, there was some visible bruising on his arms that the medical examiner had pointed out to us. Um, so. Okay. Can you get her a tissue? Oh, sorry. Detective, uh, upon the completion of the autopsy of J.J. Vallow, what did you do? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Upon the completion of J.J. Vallow's autopsy, uh, what did you do next? Dr. Warren brought in the second uh, set of remains of Tylee. Um, he undid the, the body bag. Once he saw what was inside the body bag, uh, he had advised us that um, there wasn't anything he was going to do that evening that we can come back the next day. Um, and so at that point, we left the coroner's office. Okay. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be uh, handed states, states Exhibit 12A through 12E. A and B? A through E. A through E, thank you. And detective, if you'll look at those and let me know when you've had a chance to review them. Okay. Detective, do you recognize uh, those exhibits? Yes, I do. What do they purport to be? Uh, J.J. Vallow... Um, in the condition that we first saw him after they cut open the uh, black plastic bag. So are these photos from the autopsy? They are. Okay. Uh, and you were there the entirety of the autopsy? Yes, sir. And you saw it with your own eyes? Correct. Are those exhibits 
uh, exhibits 12 A through E true and accurate representations of what you witnessed that day? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves for admission of exhibits 12 A through E. All right. Uh, is there any objection to states A through E, exhibit 12? No, Your Honor. All right. States exhibit 12 A, 12 B, 12 C. 12D and 12E are all admitted into evidence and may be published. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12A? This is the first time we saw JJ once they cut down the black plastic bag that revealed what was inside. Uh, that's JJ with the white plastic on his head. You can see where we originally cut the plastic when he was in the ground to reveal his brown hair. <clears throat> but the level, the, the amount of duct tape over his face, uh, over his arms, the body decomposition uh, is kind of what caught our attention. Okay. Uh, is that the blanket? Is the blanket you referred to earlier in that picture? Yes, that's the blue and white child's blanket that was placed on top of him. Detective, what, do you, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12B? That's the, the legs of J.J. He's still wearing the Skechers socks. Uh, still has on the red pajama pants. And his ankles are also bound with tuck tape. Were you able to observe any decomposi excuse me, decomposition fluid in that area of that that's shown in that picture? Yes, uh, it's hard to see in the picture, but uh, the whole bottom half of his uh, red pajamas were soaked with body decomposition. Thank you. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 12C? <clears throat> this is after the medical examiner first cut down the white plastic bag. Uh, like I testified earlier, he had a, a strip of duct tape around his mouth from jawline to jawline. Um, as you can see, his, his skin's going through various stages of decomposition. Um, but he was still recognizable with the brown hair and facial features that we had seen in the photographs um, for the last eight months. Detective, what, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 12D? That's the white plastic bag that was placed over J.J.'s head. Uh, it appeared to be the waffle-style type expandable trash bag that people normally put in their kitchen. It had a red drawstring. Um, but that's what was over his head. And what you're looking at, uh, uh, there's pieces of duct tape that were attached to that. And... And this is just uh, body decomposition that was inside the plastic bag from his face. And what did you observe in States, States Exhibit 12E? <clears throat> the 
that's a picture of JJ um, still with the duct tape around his mouth just a close up picture um, like I, I testified earlier you can still see the long brown hair um, the, the shape of his head it was very easily to identify that little boy on the table as, as the one we had been looking for for the last eight months Detective, did you do, after the autopsy of JJ, uh, did you do anything else uh, uh, in Ada County in regards to his remains? I assisted uh, Lieutenant Ron Ball with transporting various items from the autopsy uh, to the Idaho State Lab uh, the next day on June 12th. Okay. Uh, did you do anything further with any of the remains of Tylee Ryan in Ada County? Uh, no. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state has no further questions for Detective Hermosillo at this time. Uh, due to the nature of this case, we may need to recall him at, at other times due to the, the nature of the investigation. But for purposes of today, we have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Uh, I'll allow for cross-examination. I realize we took a long lunch break. However, given the uh, evidence just published, I think it would be appropriate to allow a Another break for the jurors just to uh, clear the air for a moment, and then we'll allow for some cross-examination. So we'll try to make this a quick break. I say that, but 15 minutes, hopefully, we'll be back on for cross-examination. We'll be in recess for the jury. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated.
do we have a different set? Can you just hold on just a second? Uh, Officer Lowe, can I just have Yes, thank you. All right, please. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Back on the record, case CR 22-211624, State v. Lori Noreen Vallow. We took a mid-afternoon break. Detective Hermosillo, you are still under oath, I'll remind you. At this time, the defense may be allowed cross-examination. Mr. Thomas, you can inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. How are you doing today? It's been a tough day. It's been a tough day. A long day. So I'm just going to uh, ask a few follow-up questions. I know that uh, the state's had you on all day, and we're hopefully going to get get this done. So uh, you indicate that um, you've been a detective for about four years now. That's correct. So you were on you were in the detective division for about a year when this uh, came down. Uh, under a year. Under a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, you indicate the first. Uh, opportunity you had to get involved in this case, I believe, was on November the November the first. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, that's when you were contacted by Gilbert PD, right? Uh, no, sir. I was contacted by Fremont County on November first. Oh, Fremont County. When were you contacted by Gilbert? What, what, what were you? Let's yeah. Let's just start there. What happened with uh, Fremont County? Why were you contacted by them? They advised me that there was a Jeep in our jurisdiction, possibly, that was involved with the attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreaux. After Fremont called me, I then contacted Gilbert to get more information. Okay, so that's where it came. Okay, so you were first contacted by Fremont, and then you got in touch with uh, Arizona, Gilbert, Arizona. Is that that's right? correct. Okay, all right. Um, and was that also on November the 1st? Did all that happen like in a series of hours or something like that? Correct. Okay. Uh, and then they asked you to uh, seize a Jeep, uh, a gray Jeep, and you indicated that you were uh, having some intermittent surveillance, right? Correct. All right. So tell me a little bit about the intermittent surveillance. How intermittent, I guess, is what I want to know. <clears throat> Throughout uh, November 1st, uh, into, I, I'd say starting November 1st, it was probably 15 hours worth of surveillance off and on. And I guess I'm, I'm asking how, over the course of how many days? Over the course of two 
two weeks probably. Okay. And, and then did you ultimately find the vehicle during that two-week period? I found it on the 4th of November. Okay. And so your 15 hours of intermittent surveillance on Chad and Lori, that was between November 1st and about November 15th. Is that right? Yeah, roughly. Okay. And when you say intermittent surveillance, like what, what would you do? Is it kind of like a stakeout type thing, or was it, was it different? Were you just driving around? How would that work out? Yeah, we parked in front of the residence uh, when we didn't have other things going on. Um, took a couple photographs uh, if we could. Uh, but basically, we were there to give any intel to Gilbert Police in reference to that. Okay. And as far as the surveillance and intel, was that done at, um, in, I'm assuming it was in Rexburg because it, because you're a Rexburg detective, right? Correct. So you weren't going to, uh, Chad's house. You were mostly staying at Lori's house when you were doing that surveillance? Correct. Okay. And about how many times did you come, did you end up seeing, uh, Chad and Lori uh, at that particular apartment during that 15 days? We saw them there the very first day, November 1st. Uh, and I don't recall seeing them after that. Okay. Um, when you say about 15 hours over about 15 days, was it about an, an hour a day or was it more different chunks, different times? Probably different chunks, different times, depending okay. on what was going on. All right, thanks. That, that's very helpful. Um, you indicate that the first time that you heard of JJ uh, was when you seized. No, this was this was a little bit confusing for me. You said the first time that you heard of JJ uh, was when the, the jeep was seized on November. November the 4th, but then you said on November the 18th, I think was when you said you, the first time you, you, uh, heard about JJ. Is that right? The first time we heard of JJ was November 18th when Gilbert police came up to seize the infotainment center from the Jeep that we had originally seized on the 4th. Okay. And help me understand. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a car guy. So what is an infotainment center? It's the, the, has the GPS locations, uh, the, just the, the middle portion of, of, uh, the inside of the Jeep or the radio. Okay. Where you can program your maps. They took that. Gilbert police took that, seized that, and that's the first time that we had heard of JJ. Okay. Um, so is, I hate to use this term. Is it kind of like the black box of the Jeep now, or, or, or is that something that's still like under the seat type thing? Do you know? I can't answer that. You don't know? Okay. All right. But at any rate, they took the infotainment center, right? Correct. Okay. Didn't take anything else out of the Jeep? or Not that I can recall, no. Okay. And they didn't take the Jeep itself? No, sir. When you, um, on November the 26th, you went to 565 Pioneer Road and uh, talked to Alex Cox and Chad Daybell while they were standing outside of the garage, I believe, at uh, 175, is that right? Correct. Um, you indicated, well, I don't know if you did indicate or not, uh, were you wearing a body cam? When you were talking to them? No, sir. So you're, wh who else was with you when you were talking to them? Detective Hope. And was Detective Hope wearing a body cam? No, sir. Were either of you wearing um, some type of audio recording device? No, sir. Okay. So whatever was said, um, that would have been from your recollection, not from anything that you've reviewed, like a, a video or an audio? That's correct. Okay.
So, and, and the reason that you were at uh, Lori's apartment was um, for a welfare check on on JJ. Is that right? On the twenty sixth. Yes, I'm sorry. On the twenty sixth of November, twenty nineteen. Yes, that's correct. All right. And you indicated that you called uh, Lieutenant Ball, Lieutenant Ron Ball, um, who is kind of over you, is that right? That's right. All right. And so um, you thought there was some suspicious activity uh, with regards to your conversation, and then you decided to get a warrant. Uh, so what was, what was the basis of getting the warrant? The basis of the warrant was the actions of Mr. Daybell, Mr. Cox on the 26th, the fact that we were advised that J.J. was with a family friend who later determined that there was, J.J. was never with her, that was a lie, uh, based on... Well, hold on. I apologize for breaking in. But when you said, based on the family friend, that didn't happen when you went to go get the warrant, right? That happened later, right? No, sir. That happened the 26th. That night, we were able to confirm that J.J. was not with Melanie Gibb, and that was not the case. Okay. So, and after that conversation, that was when you were going to go to the prosecutor's office and get the warrant? After the conversation that with Melanie Gibb. Ron Ball and Dave Stubbs had with Lori Vallow, mm-hmm. where she told those detectives that J.J. was at a movie with Melanie Gibb at Frozen 2. Yes. Once we were able to talk to Melanie Gibb, Melanie Gibb says, that is not true, that was a lie. That was not the case. The next morning, we obtained the search warrant. Okay. So, but what you testified on direct exam, and I'm not trying to trip you up, I'm just trying to figure out what, what actually, what the sequence of events was. You talked to Chad, he finally gave up Lori's phone number, you called Lieutenant Ball, thought that it was suspicious, Dave Stubbs arrives, they knock on 175, no answer. All those are correct, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, then you go and knock on 174, which was Melanie Pulowski, Melanie uh, Bedro's house, is that right? Correct. No answer? Correct. Okay. And then it says, the next thing I have, and this, this is probably me, it says, go, into the prosecu- go to the prosecutor's office to get a warrant. Is that what happened? That's correct. Okay. So this was before anybody called Melanie Gibb and found out that there was... Uh, that, that they weren't at Frozen 2, right? No, sir. Okay. So originally we went to go get the warrant, and if you remember I testified that when we were at the prosecutors to get the warrant, Lori Vallow then called Detective Hope back, and she was advised to open her front door. Then Lori spoke with the detectives, and that's where the body cam with Lieutenant Ball and Dave Stubbs come in where Lori admits that J.J. was with a family friend. But you were already at the prosecutor's office getting the warrant, or attempting to get a warrant, right? That's correct. Okay. And what was the basis? What was the crime that was committed that you needed to get a warrant? We didn't obtain the warrant. I know, but in order to... Okay. So you just went to the prosecutor's office hoping to get a warrant on a hunch? It wasn't a hunch. It was based on uh, the lies that we were being told, uh, the concern that we had for J.J. at what, that point. What was the crime? Lying to the police about the whereabouts of J.J. And that's what the warrant was going to be based on? We didn't get the warrant, sir. I know you didn't get the warrant, but you said you attempted to get a warrant, or you walked over to get a warrant. I, I can't speculate whether the judge would have given us the warrant or not. Okay. You ended up getting a warrant the next day, is that right? <coughs> That's correct. And you found some guns and some magazines and some other 
paraphernalia. Uh, and when I say paraphernalia, I mean like weaponry, paraphernalia stuff like that. You understand? Correct. Uh, did you at any time during the investigation, was there anything that led you to believe that Lori Vallow or Lori Daybell was involved in having those weapons or owned those weapons? No, sir. Okay. And, and when I say paraphernalia, I mean like the ghillie suit. That that wasn't look that didn't look like something that would fit her, right? I, I can't answer that. Okay. You didn't okay. You talked a little bit about um, proof of life, and your definition, according to what I wrote down, and I may be wrong, but what I wrote down was any documentation that would confirm that a person was alive. Is that is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. Would that be your definition? That's my definition, yes. Okay. Um, and so you indicated that the last proof of life that you got for Tylee was on September the 8th. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, isn't it true that you had hundreds of tips that came in with regards to where Tylee and JJ were in the months after this September the 8th? That's true. We had hundreds of tips come in after September the 8th, mm -hmm. none of which were verified to be Tylee. Okay. But you didn't vet every every tip. We right? followed up on every tip. You followed up on every tip? Yes, sir. There was there was never a time where uh you said, Oh wow, we called this number and nobody answered and so we we just never followed up after that one phone call. That never happened? No, there could have been those times. Okay. But we followed up on every tip. That's right. Okay. But you didn't follow it up to the point where you knew that it wasn't true. Um Correct. Okay. Um, with regards to uh, the death of Tammy Daybell, um, Tammy Daybell died on October the 19th, 2019, as far as you know, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and do you know where Lori Daybell was on... October the 19th, or I'm sorry, at that time she was Lori Vallow. Do you know where Lori Vallow was on October the 19th, 2019? I do. Where was she? Hawaii. Okay. Um, so she wasn't anywhere near Tammy Daybell when Tammy Daybell died? That's correct. When you searched the... Uh, property of Chad Dayville on June the 9th. Um, you said you got there around 7 a.m., is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And this wasn't something that was like a spur-of-the-moment thing where you got some guys together and all ran out, got a warrant the day before. I mean, this was something that was planned. I guess what I'm saying is this is something that was planned, correct? Correct. For, for weeks, maybe even months? Uh, I wouldn't go that far, probably weeks, maybe. Okay. Um, I mean, long enough to get a backhoe out there and set some stuff up, right? I mean, there was there was some planning involved. Correct. Okay. Uh, and you said you got there around 7 a.m. Uh, I believe you kind of alluded to, but I kind of want to nail it down, uh, that the FBI ERT team, the evidence recovery team, they were kind of the ones running point or the ones in charge of the uh, of the search. Is that right? Once the scene was secure, yes, they were in charge of the search. Okay. So how long did it take to secure the scene? Long enough for us to make contact with Chad and the kids and make sure there were no potential threats inside the residence. So I'm guessing... 20 minutes. Okay. And 
And when you arrived at 7 a.m., there were a bunch of people that arrived at the same time, right? I mean, no, you weren't the no, lone, sir. You were the lone gunman going in? No, there were three of us, three or four of us. Okay. You and who else? Uh, myself, Lieutenant Ron Ball, Detective Vince Kai Kamanu, uh, I think maybe Detective, uh, let's see, David Stubbs was there. I believe that was it. Okay, so the four of you. Um, and where did everybody else stage in preparation to go to the? To did they? I guess I'm saying there was a there were a bunch of people there, probably thirty or forty people that were involved in this. Correct. Where were they while you guys were securing the scene? They staged at the church in Sugar Salem on the Sugar Salem Highway. Okay. About two miles away from just just down the road, maybe two miles from where Chad Daybell's house is. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you know, you you said that you'd only been doing this for less than a year prior to, uh, prior to becoming or prior to this case coming on. Was this your first time at the scene of a crime like this, where you would? Where the FBI was in charge and you guys were just kind of worker bees, so to speak. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to discount your job or what you were doing, but I mean, they were kind of the experts, and you guys were kind of the ones that were uh, were there to help out, right? I've worked with the FBI, Homeland Security. Uh, we've served search warrants on different places um, when I was in patrol, even as a patrol supervisor. Oh, okay. Um, when they would come into our jurisdiction, we would assist them. They would assist us. So it's not the first time I've worked with the FBI or, or agencies like that. Mm -hmm. um, to this magnitude, uh, yes, the, that was the first time. Okay. Um, thank you. That was very helpful. And over the last 22 <coughs> years uh, of you being involved, you know, you mentioned that you'd done this before. Um, about how many times had you done uh, a search where the FBI was involved and you were kind of helping them out? How many times do you, would you say? Probably five or six times. Okay, okay. Um, you, you you mentioned uh, in serving the search warrant that there were a bunch of different agencies involved. You mentioned the FBI, the FBI uh, ERT, or the Evidence Recovery Team, Fremont County, Rexburg Police Department, Idaho Attorney General's Office. I want to say I remember reading something about um, either Boise City Police or, or, or Ada County Sheriff's Office, something like that. Do you remember anybody from them? They weren't there assisting us. They were set up uh, in different locations throughout the the highway in case uh, somebody needed to be followed. Okay. And was that Boise or was that Ada County? Do you remember? I believe, I believe it was Boise. Okay, that's what uh, I thought. Their surveillance team. I didn't want to. Okay. And they were part of the surveillance team? Correct. Okay. You mentioned um, the fact that uh, Chad was out of his home in his car uh, and that he, you had walked up to him and asked him if he needed a coat or a jacket. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you said uh, that you thought that it was uh, peculiar or caught your attention, I guess I should say, that he was looking over his shoulder. Um, and then you said that he was looking in the direction of a tree near the pond area where J.J. ended up being found. Is that right? Correct. Okay. But, I mean, isn't it true that, I mean, that's a pretty wide view. You could be looking at any number of things, right? He was looking towards the tree pond area. Okay. But you weren't looking at him to see where his eyes were, right? I wasn't looking into his eyes. Is right. That you weren't asking? looking eye to eye with him. No, I was not looking eye to eye with him. Okay. So you don't necessarily know where he was looking. He was looking towards the pond area under the tree, towards the tree. Okay. 
I guess we'll just agree to disagree. <laughs> um, so your first task, I believe, uh, by the evidence recovery team was that you were to sift through the fire pit. Um, were there a number of agents or a number of officers uh, or detectives that were involved in sifting through the fire pit with you, or were you kind of the lone guy on that on the fire pit area? No, there were a couple other detectives uh, and also uh, members from the ERT team as well, kind of directing us on, on what they needed or what to do. Okay. So in the fire pit area, I saw, I saw that um, there was some pink tape or pink ribbon that was kind of marked out in, in an area in one of the photographs. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And the fire pit area was specifically marked out as a particular area? Correct. How big of an area would you say that that uh, was marked out? Because I didn't have a, any type of a ruler. I wasn't there. I don't know. Oh, I'd say... I, I couldn't even guess. Okay. It was it was a a large area. Large area. So when when they took the photograph of the fire pit and you identified it as the fire pit, um, it didn't just encompass that one circle of uh, cinder blocks or the or the wood around it, right? It was a lot more land than that. It was the fire pit area correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and so about how long was it between when you went in and originally secured the scene? You said it was about 20 minutes. And then when did you start working on the fire pit? Uh, I'd, I'd probably say between 8 and 8.30 maybe. Okay. And then I have written down here that, um... The pond area, there was a search from about 9 a.m. observed while sifting through the fire pit. Did that happen around 9 a.m.? You were at the fire pit for about half an hour, I guess is what I'm saying? Roughly. I, I didn't keep track, but I would say roughly half okay. hour-ish. And so then a half hour goes by, and then something else is going on at the pond area, um, and you're taken over there or you're asked to come over there? Correct. Okay. And a number of people stayed at the uh, at the fire pit area, is that right? I, I can't answer that. I was over at the, the pond at that point. Okay. Were you called over by one of the ERTs? I don't remember who I was called over by. Somebody. Somebody. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that's fair. <clears throat> um, now, st State's Exhibit 10A, there, there was some talk about... <coughs> excavation of the backyard and that was um i believe in some of the photographs that i've seen there was a there was actually a backhoe is that right a large piece of equipment i'm sorry you have to answer audibly <coughs> sorry swallow drum i'm sorry that's correct okay um and <coughs> this backhoe uh were you there when it took the first piece of uh topsoil off of the uh, off of the ground at the, at the place where J.J. was buried? We didn't use the backhoe where oh. J.J. was buried. Okay. So the first picture that I saw that was published, I don't know the na number, but it just had all the grassy part, and then there was a small patch that was not as grassy. Right? Correct. You understand that picture? Yes. Okay. And then the next picture that I saw was a place where they had already taken off that top layer of grass. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay. And so how did that layer of grass get taken off? With shovels. Okay. And how deep, uh, were you were you involved in digging that first layer off? I did not participate in digging the first layer, no. Did you watch the first layer be taken off? I did. Okay. So, I mean, I, I don't know how, the, how, how it worked out, but did they go in... Uh, like in a, uh, what type of shovel was it? Was it a spade shovel or was it a flat ended uh, shovel? I can't remember, sir. You don't remember. How deep was the first layer? How much was pulled off at first? 
um, roughly an inch, maybe. So very little. Correct. Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Thomas. Um, yes. Apologies for the interruption. Oh wow! I didn't even know I was going to go that long. Well, we're and uh, I don't want to rush your cross examination. I think there will be more for the detective tomorrow in any regards. So okay. I think it would be a good time for us to adjourn for the day. Um, <clears throat> before we do that, as I've told the jurors before, and I will continue to tell you again, and I appreciate your <coughs> attentiveness to this instruction before we break for the day. Please do not talk to anyone about this case, including each other. Please don't do any research or look the case up online or take every effort if you can to please avoid viewing anything about the case in the media that you may run across between now and tomorrow. Uh, you'll be asked to sign that juror affirmation again. We appreciate the effort you've put into this case thus far. And with that admonishing instruction in mind, then we'll see you tomorrow to commence again, uh, scheduled to start at 830 so if everyone would please rise for the jury, we'll adjourn for the day. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Council, before we adjourn for the day, I'm going to uh, ask that council remain in. Uh, I've got an issue to discuss with the council, which will be in a closed proceeding, so we'll uh, clear the courtroom and uh, turn off the simulcast also to conclude for the day. Before we take that up, is there anything else the state wishes to bring up before we adjourn for the day in the public setting? Nothing from the state. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Anything further from the defense? All right, thank you. Uh, we'll take a brief five-minute break here to allow the public to clear the courtroom. You can be excused as well, and we'll see you here tomorrow. And we will uh, conduct a hearing that the court determines needs to be closed for reasons I'll state on the record once we call that up. This is continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. Continuous coverage. In the trial of Lori Vallow Daybell from the Hidden Killers Podcast. Hidden Killers Podcast. There is more to come. Court coverage for you every single day. Analysis of the day's events and much more. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of it. My name is Tony Bruski. Stay with us.